Hi, Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Hi, welcome to the Heaven Series. Today, my guest is Rosemary Thornton, and I am so inspired by her story for a number of reasons. She died, had an encounter with angels and the Holy Spirit. That's something that we don't talk about much on this show because the Holy Spirit is something, someone, I should say, that is not readily identifiable. But what we're going to talk to Rosemary about her encounter. And Rosemary, it is a delight to have you on our show today. Thank you so much. Rosemary, uh, you do have an account and insights that I think are exceptional. Uh, you wrote a book uh, that is called The Light. Um, remembering the Light. How remembering the Light. My life. Excuse me. I have my note right here and I've actually <laughs> read your book and I love the book. Um, we'll be noting that in the body of this message so you can order that book. And Rosemary is a writer. Uh, so I'm not going to delve too much into your story, Rosemary, because we need to, uh, to get to your account and your insights from what you experienced. Thank you. Uh, it's, it is quite a story. There are times that I sit down with my own book and think, wow, that's a story. <laughs> Cause, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's still a lot to take in. They say the average person who has a near-death experience, it takes them about seven years to fully assimilate the experience. And I'm just uh, three and a half years out from that. But I do believe uh, a lot of clarity came to me quickly because I needed to be healed. Uh, 29 months prior to my near-death experience, my husband, a man that I thought was the answer to a lifetime of prayers, uh, ended his life unexpectedly. He was successful. He was accomplished, sophisticated, a bon vivant, an interesting man, very, very, uh, a very brilliant man. And I, I was devastated be, beyond what words can easily describe. Folks have said suicide is a death like no other. And that is true. I had always thought he was, well, he was seven years older than me. And I thought that we'd have a more traditional ending of Perhaps me sitting at his bedside in a hospital holding his hand as his life faded and exchanging I love yous and I'll see you again. And so this to say this was a shock is an understatement. There were no warnings. There there were no ideas that this was coming. In fact, he had talked a lot about his upcoming retirement. So I thought we were on a path. I thought there was a plan. And he and I, uh, we had... Um, uh, little, um, what do you call them, e-readers, and at night we would curl up together in bed and we would read our books individually and collectively. Sometimes we'd read our books to each other and other times we would just read. And I knew that it, finding him was very special. And so to lose him, it, it's a loss on so many levels, but then to have it end with suicide. And one of the things I talk about in my book is we had discussed the purchase of a refrigerator for many, many months. And ultimately arrived at a conclusion and found something on clearance at a department store. And uh, after his death, one of my thoughts was, how is it we discussed a refrigerator for several months? And this happens with absolutely no warning. And people are not kind. Uh, people wanted a lot of, this, all, you get the same questions. Well, there must have been a sign. You must have known something. And one of the things I realized, and, and I think this is true with any severe trauma, I think people say things to comfort themselves. And I think they need to take a deep breath and ask themselves, is this going to make me feel better? Is it going to make her feel worse? Because when someone's in trauma and you have no way of understanding what they're going through, the best thing really is to show up and shut up, hold them, cry with them, just just hang on to them. And after this experience, uh, a friend, a very a good friend uh, would come to the house and would literally just hold me like a child. I mean, she'd sit on the couch beside me, put her arm around me her arm around my shoulder and I would sob. I made a noise my daughter described as the pterodactyl scream where I would just scream in agony. And my, I would clear a room with that scream. People would run when I started screaming like that. Cause I'm, 
I'm actually pretty reserved and pretty laid back, and I, I like, I'm really good at hiding pain. So to see Rosemary the writer, who uh, I thought was pretty aloof and pretty mysterious, screaming out like this really shocked everybody. But my friend, I learned later, didn't know it at the time, but she had been through her own very severe trauma and had survived it. it. Took her about five years, but she survived it. And that's the thing. After you've been through a trauma of this level, if you get through it and you get your wits back about you and you come to the other side of it, then you can help others. In fact, I got a phone call the other night at one in the morning from a woman going through her own dark night of the soul. And she would say, nobody understands. I, I, I don't know how to manage this much pain. And I would say, I understand. And she would stop. She'd stop crying and she'd say, I know you do. And that's the thing. I think when we get to the other side of this, it's really the reason I wrote the book. Because I think we have a duty to comfort others. I had absolutely zero intention of writing a book because writing is hard. I've written nine books. One book took six years of research. I write about, um, well, it's nonfiction, historic architecture. One book, six years. Who spends six years of their life writing one book? Nobody. <laughs> oh, I guess people do. But what compelled me to do this was uh, several people said it might it might be a blessing to others. It might be helpful. And so I did. I spent a lot of time just asking God, what would you have me do? So... Uh, to, to get to the, I guess, to the heart of the story, uh, I was married, living a, what I thought was a, a lovely life with a lovely man. I really did think it was the answer to my prayers. I kept a daily gratitude list of five things that I was grateful for every day, and he was often on that list. My home was on the list. I had been a writer and, and had never had a really extraordinary income, which, you know, everyone thinks authors are rich. No, there's, <laughs> there's a few authors that are rich, but most of us just write for love. Uh, so <laughs> I had fiction, financial. Some of the fiction writers that are, uh, you know, that we would remember, remember their name, but, but not. Yes. Uh, yes that is no. true. Yeah. So I was very grateful to have stability. Uh, to have uh, a husband with a nice job and he came home every day and gave me a nice kiss. And I mean, it seemed like my life had really evened out and things were going well. So this launched me into a mess. I was not able to care for myself. In fact, for a very brief time, I guess a handful of days I was living out of my car. I couldn't get comfortable anywhere. I certainly wasn't going to stay at the house and very, uh, some very kind souls offered to take me in, but they were not able to manage this level of trauma. I had nightmares. I'd wake up in the middle of the scream. I'd wake up the whole household with screaming and wandering and pacing and, you know, bad scene. And then I found the car was very comfortable. It was a nice car, had a sunroof, good sound system. But, um, a friend of mine on the periphery of my life, uh, found out I had been sleeping in the car and she said, we're not doing this. You're coming home with me. I said, nope. Been there, done that, tried it. Nobody wants me in their house, you know. And she said, "Look, you're my you're my uh, famous author friend, which is a stretch. <laughs> I I wrote some books, but I never made it to fame." <laughs> uh, but she said, "I'm not going to watch this." And so she took me into her home, and she it was a brilliant move, absolutely brilliant. I said, "I I can't do this." Her name was Tracy. She's mentioned in the book, and she said, "We'll try it for one night," which is genius. It was actually it was inspired. Again, that word spirit, you mentioned the Holy Spirit. Spirit's a big word. You know, spirit means pneuma, means wind. It's it's a big word. Inspiration, spirit, they all come from the same word. But anyway, so Tracy's move was inspired. I could I could do it for one night. And so every night she'd say, come back tonight. And uh, at night, and, and this really speaks, you and I were talking briefly a moment ago about uh, the Holy Spirit and the power of prayer and, and the place of God in all this. I mean, I have had people tell me if I took the God stuff out of my book, it'd be, it would sell much better. And what do you have? What do you have when you take the God stuff out? You have, in my opinion, you have nothing mm -hmm. and certainly nothing that has the potential to bless others. I mean, I, I have had a handful of people call me and are having grave and onerous problems. And I, I tell them my number one advice is find, find somebody, a, a Christian counselor, psychiatrist, somebody, because you're not going to solve this in your own head. You're not going to solve this through affirmations, through anything. You have to get outside of yourself. You have to find someone outside of yourself. And I did. I actually, the reason I offered this advice, I saw a Christian psychologist for some time. And she was an enormous blessing. And she would end each session with prayer. So back to my friend Tracy, uh, she worked a very hard job and she'd come home at night and I'm sleeping in the guest room. And she said many nights when she tiptoed into the guest room to check on me, I would be writhing in pain. I'd be crying in my sleep. I'd be making moaning noises. And uh, 
she would stand at the foot of the bed and pray for me. And it's her first response. She was raised as a Christian. She's a very faithful Christian. And that's how she, that was her best idea for comfort. And she was right. Again, an inspired move. As my daughter says, a real Jesus move. I love that. So Tracy would stand at the foot of my bed and pray. And she said, invariably, you would settle down. You would calm down. The crying would stop. The moaning would stop. The writhing would stop. And your breathing would calm down as well. And she said, you'd settle into a peaceful sleep. So she developed a habit of every night she came in that room to check on me, she would pray for me. And even her church, which I attended from time to time, I was so messed up, I couldn't even sit in one place for very long. But I started attending her church in a tiny town in um, near the east coast of Virginia. And she asked her church to pray for me. So I had an entire congregation praying for me. And I had a website at the time, searshomes.org, which is you know where I had a lot of blogs and a lot of pictures. And that's kind of what my books were about. And I would blog occasionally and I would just say, I need prayer. And people would post. It's amazing the innate goodness of people. People would post, I pray for you every day or I will pray for you now. And I many times when I felt the pain had overwhelmed my ability to function. And this, again, is the 29 months between my husband's suicide and my own NDE. I would take my little phone, my iPhone, and I would lay in bed and I would scroll through the comments at my own website of people saying, I'm praying for you right now. You're in my prayers. I love your book. I pray for you. And I would tell myself, I was always saying the same thing. I would say, prayer is effective. And these people are praying for me. These people are showing God's love in human form. And prayer is going to help me. And I would just think about that. And it's so easy to think about all that's wrong in your life and what a mess it is and how you're coming out of your skin and you're coming unglued. But I would just think these people are showing me God's love on earth. And I would just dwell on that. And there were so many times I just said the words, prayer is effective. These people are praying for me. They're including me in a circle of God's love. And I do believe that was part of my healing. The other thing that I did was I covered my house. I was in a rental home after I moved out of Tracy's house. I was in with Tracy for four months, which is a long time to live in somebody's spare bedroom. But I was in her house for four months, and then I rented a house in a nearby city, and a friend moved in with me there to take care of me. I still could not care for myself. But that was the house. I literally covered the house in Bible verses and inspirational messages. And something somebody had told me, her sister her, her, my friend, um, her sister had ended her own life uh, as a teenager, and my friend had witnessed this by gunshot. And my friend decided early on that she would ask God every day, heal me so that I can help heal others. And so I had that on a piece of paper on my wall as well. God, please heal me so I can help others. So those were my guiding lights. And, you know, I've heard people say that I seem to know a lot of Bible verses it's because they were slathered all over my house. And the idea was when I was even walking through my own house, I would often have a panic attack. And I would turn wherever I was, hallway, bedroom, even the bathrooms, and I could read a Bible verse right then and there. And that was immensely comforting. And, you know, I think my healing began. I've shared this story. Um, I was had just landed in Boston when word came about what my husband had done. And I had to scramble to get flights back home. And that is a hard, it's hard to fly last minute anyway. And when you're in that state, I was in shock. I was in pretty bad shock. But I managed to get on a Southwest plane that was heading my way. And uh, God bless Southwest Airlines, but they held the plane for me. I didn't even know they did that anymore. But I was busy getting my ticket at the counter. And the man said, we're holding it for you, but run. So I ran down the corridor. And as I approached the plane with my uh, boarding pass, the gate agent, said, are you Miss Lawrence? I said, yes. And she grabbed the boarding pass as I ran and said, keep running. And literally, as soon as I stepped through that door, they slammed it shut. But they had one seat left on that plane. It was a 737-800, which I think holds something like 160 or 70 people. I should know that fact. But it's a big plane. And the one seat left, and I took one seat that was left. And I sat down, and as you do, this, this nice man, he said, you look you look distraught. Are you okay? Which is a pretty lovely thing to ask. I mean, you see somebody looking distraught on an airplane, you're kind of like, okay, I'll look out the window. <laughs> but he very generously said, are you okay? And I said, my husband just shot himself. I'm a mess. I, I don't know what to do. And he said, for somebody whose husband just shot himself, he said, you look like you're rather composed. And I said, it's an act. But he said, I want you to remember for the rest of your life that God is watching out for you. And the angels are with you even now, even in this moment. And I was like, okay, you got my interest, what? And he told me his mother 
had killed herself. And the last conversation I had had with my husband had been an ugly argument on the phone. He hung up and he did this thing. And I had told my seatmate this. And he said, my mother did the same thing. She started an ugly argument. She hung up on me and then she killed herself. And he said, so it's not coincidence that you end up sitting next to me. He said, because I can tell you, you will heal. It's going to take some time. And then he laid out kind of a path as to how I would heal. And he said things like, there will be a day when you realize you went 15 minutes without thinking about this last argument, without thinking about the horror of it all. And he said, there'll be a day where you go 24 hours and realize I didn't cry today. And he said, you know, and it, it will take years, but you'll heal. And so I really do think that's when my healing began. I really do. That was that's quite a coincidence to end up seated next to that guy. And so 29 months, I, I tried my best, but I wasn't managing well. And then uh, I was diagnosed with cancer, cervical cancer. I went to a doctor. I went to a couple doctors. They did a cervical biopsy to determine how far it had spread. Something went awry. And uh, uh, while I was still in the recovery room, because they anesthetize you. I'd never been anesthetized in my whole life. Uh, while I was still in the recovery room, I told the RN who was attending me, I'm bleeding an awful lot. <laughs> I don't think it's supposed to be like this. And she said, not once, but three times. Because I asked three times. She said, once you get home, lie down, you'll be fine. Went home, lie down. I wasn't fine. In fact, I have really, really pretty carpet throughout my house. And I was very concerned about messing up that carpet. Because when you're bleeding to death, the most important thing is housekeeping. So I actually went and stood in my shower. And I had been praying three prayers pretty faithfully every night. Very faithfully. One was... Uh, I asked God, heal me or let me go. I knew I could not stay in this state of misery. My second prayer was when I die, and I knew it wouldn't be long. Uh, spare me a life review. I had recurring nightmares of seeing my husband um, with do this. Uh, he used a gun. And I had recurring nightmares of witnessing the whole thing. I had recurring nightmares of getting to him just as he did it, just before he did it, just after he did it. The nightmares were brutal, absolutely brutal. So I told, I begged God. I said, when I die, no life review. I've seen how ugly life can be. Please don't ask me to sit through this again. And then my third prayer was I couldn't manage any more decisions. After his death, there had been many legal messes that had to be tidied up, which required a lot of decisions. In fact, as I tell in my book, I, I had gotten to a point that I bought, uh, I think, a dozen white polo shirts and four pairs of pants. So every morning, there was no decisions. What collar to wear? What shirt to wear? I just opened the closet, pulled something out, put it on. So standing in my bathroom, I thought, uh, you know, you ask God to let you die or uh, heal you, and maybe this is the answer. Then I knew I was bleeding to death. Uh, and I thought my friend Tracy had read me a Bible verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which says very plainly, God will show you a way out. I thought, this is an answer to that prayer. God is showing me the way. And I realized now that might have, I don't know that that was from God. I mean, I don't know. I don't have any easy answer for that. But I thought all I have to do is sit down on this bathroom floor and I'm out. I knew I was, it wouldn't take long. And I really thought about that. And I also thought about the two people taking such good care of me that were in my house with me. They brought me home from this surgical procedure. I thought, is that really fair to them to see this, come in here and find me like this? So I decided to step out of that bathroom and I walked out into the main area, wrapped some towels around me, walked out into the main area and asked them to call for an ambulance. Ambulance came and took me to a little ER. The little ER, they made some more boo-boos. <laughs> so it turns out when a woman's having a bleeding episode like that, it's real bad. You should do something. So at the little ER, there was a very lovely nurse. And by the way, this ER was not connected to a hospital. Note to self, if you ever get taken to an ER, make sure that they have a hospital like next door or something. So, oh my goodness. That's yeah. yeah. I mean, like physically connected. They had a corporate connection, but not a physical connection. But yeah, this wow. very this nice nurse about my age held my hand. And at this point, I'm like, you know, let's get this show on the road. And I said, promise me you're not gonna let me die. And she said, Oh, honey, we have many solutions for this. We're not gonna let you die. It's like, oh, okay. And then uh they gave me a shot of Dilaudid which it turns out is a real bad thing to do to somebody who's bleeding out. So I'm already down a few pints and they give me this painful narcotic. that's actually a morphine derivative. And that, that, that thing hit my heart. My heart, my heart basically was like, what, what did you just do? I can't, I'm fighting with everything I got. Anyway, uh, I, I literally bled to death and I believe it was that last shot of Dilaudid that, you know, kind of greased the skids to the afterlife. 
the last blood pressure because they had left the room the nurse and the doctor left the room and i was there with my buddy who was watching over me and it's pretty cool he said my blood pressure last blood pressure anybody saw was 32 over 25 which means you're gone it means oh, you're going bye-bye and right. then uh he said i opened my eyes and there's a term for this. It's called terminal lucidity. Apparently, at the very end of life, it's not unusual for there to be a, a burst of energy. And he said, you opened your eyes, you tried to sit up on the gurney, you reached to heaven and wiggled your fingers, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, almost like a child reaching up for their parent. Mm. And he said, and then you flopped back down and your blood pressure went to error, which meant it was lower than 32 over 25. Mm. And meanwhile... I was having a great time. And I mean, great time. The last thing I remember was when they put that drug into the IV. And I remember throwing my head back and saying, that's some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember so vividly that I had, it was like being awakened from a deep dreamless state. And I was catapulted out of my body very dramatically. And I mean, catapulted almost jarring, but not. And the instant that that happened, I realized I knew exactly what was happening. Uh, I had spent my life reading NDE accounts from Daniel Brinkley to Betty Eady to George Ritchie. I think I read all of them. Howard Storm. Oh my gosh, he's got a great story. So I'd read, and, and, and in this experience, I even thought about those books and I thought, oh, I know what this is. I'm dying. And then I thought, actually, you're not dying. You're dead, which cracked me up because being a writer, you want to get your grammar right. That's the most important thing when you're going on to your reward. And I thought that was pretty darn funny. <laughs> I'm correcting my grammar because I'm dying. <laughs> and, That's a first, well, by the way. Yes. Oh, I hope. Yes. I've never heard that. <laughs> and I, I laughed out loud. And I just thought that was so cool because everything I am went with me down to my funny little giggle. And that was the other thing. I was producing sound and I was hearing sound. And I thought to myself, I don't have breath sounds. I'm pretty sure I don't have vocal cords. Don't know about lungs, but I don't think I have them. And yet I am, I am producing the sound and I'm hearing it and I'm giggling. And I still have my funny little giggle. And it was such an immense comfort that everything we are goes with us, even down to our unique sense of humor. I just thought that was so great because when you're dying, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess I just had a different idea of what this would be like. And it was, I just can't address how big a comfort that was. And very early in this experience, and I, I've said this before, it's the best analogy I can come up with. It's like I lived my whole life at 60 amps and I had been upgraded to 100,000 amps. It's like that whole life was just like the Bible says, like a vapor, like a mist. And now it was over. I was like, whoa, 59 years and change and I'm out. And I remember thinking very clearly because I had been diagnosed with stage two cervical cancer. It had already spread to nearby areas. I mean, that was the oncologist assessment at the first physical exam. I remember thinking uh, that once a week chemo and that daily radiation isn't going to be an issue, is it? I mean, I was really grateful that I was out. So, oh gosh, I'm so grateful. And I even thought about my own husband's suicide. And I had struggled mightily with suicidal ideations of my own. I mean, I had a plan, a place. I had everything I needed. I would often ponder the peace I would finally have when I ended my own life. And so I thought I got out of this without doing that to myself. In fact, people will say she went for medical care. She did everything she could. And I had all those thoughts. My memory was very clear, very precise. But very early in this experience, I felt, and I was floating in blackness. I know that's not. I don't know. I was floating away from my body in this blackness and several people have said, well, that's kind of weird that you were in this fat, but the blackness was the most perfect peace I've ever experienced. The most perfect peace times a million. And in fact, I thought about the Bible verse, the peace that passeth all understanding. Paul said that. And I thought, this is that peace. This is what Paul talked about. This is the peace you can't explain to anybody. It surpasses all understanding. And, and it was so comforting that I remembered all these Bible verses and I remembered everything in great detail. And I even remember thinking it felt like early release for good behavior. You know, that I, I, there's an old song, um, the earth is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And that was so clear to me. I had done my time and I was, I was going home and it was such a minor, uh, such a minor slip from here to there. You know, we think of heaven as being this big thing. 
but we're just slipping home, slipping through a door and going back home. And the familiarity I felt. Uh, so about the blackness, uh, a lot of people have said, well, you know, it should have been light, it should have been this. There are people who talk about seeing their own body as they float further and further away. And it is so clear to me. I mean, my friend got chewed out of that little ER cubicle as the medical staff worked to resuscitate me, which involved heart stuff and shocking me back to life and all that. And uh, he said three times the door opened that little cubicle and somebody came out with an armful of uh, linens, literally soaked in blood. So when that doctor had attended to me, she had used gauze to pack me and uh and it turned out that did not stop the bleeding. It just stopped the mess. So I really think it was God's mercy saying, you don't need to see what's happening there. Let's not look at that. Mm. You know, just like a father would do for a child going past a, a car accident or something. You know, I, I put that under the column of God's mercy. So that blackness was like actively comforting me. And within that blackness, I felt myself joined by a massive spiritual presence and i mean massive it was so clear to me this was not just an angel and i, I don't mean to be dismissive just an angel <laughs> but it was something much bigger and i turned to my left and looked up this was slightly behind me and i thought i'm looking to my left which means i seem to have some human-esque form you know i'm looking over my left shoulder so it's all pretty interesting and i said with a lilt in my voice literally i said and who are you and the answer, before I could even finish the sentence, the answer was immediate. You are the image and likeness. I'm the original. I was like, wow, that's First Genesis 26 and 27 that were made in the image and likeness of God. And that had always been a much cherished Bible verse. But I struggled so much to understand what it meant to be made in God's image and likeness. So I've had, I've asked a lot of people, was that God? Was it Jesus? And I think I don't know, but I think it was, as we discussed moments ago, the Holy Spirit. You know, again, I don't know, but it was it was something very special and not a day of my life. Sometimes not an hour of my life goes by. I don't think about I'm the in image and likeness and there is an original. And it's just quite a thing. So this experience went on and on and on. Uh, ultimately. I, I mean, this is an aside. I was dead more than 10 minutes. And something I learned is they can't even do CPR on somebody who bleeds to death because it just pushes out more blood. So I had no oxygenation to my brain for more than 10 minutes. And it's believed that after five or six, there's brain damage. And I swear I came back with an upgrade. I didn't just come back. I came back with a serious upgrade. Uh, but floating away in this blackness, I thought about some Bible verses. I thought about so many times I thought, wow, I wish I'd known this in life. You know, I wish, and I also kind of wished, I mean, I had been quite, uh, I had read the Bible almost every day of my life. I had read through the Bible multiple times, beginning to end. I had those Bible verses taped to every wall of my house. I had read, uh, are you familiar with the Interpreter's Bible? It's 12 volumes. Yes. I had read most of that. I had read William Barclay's Bible commentaries. I read all of them. So I was a pretty serious student of the Bible. And I thought, I wish instead of reading it, I had understood that this really is the word of God. You know, and I, I did think about in the beginning was the word and the word is with God and the word was God. The whole world started with the word of God. You know, it's one of the things I love about being a writer. Words have such power. And I wish I had, I remember thinking, I wish I'd understood that the Bible wasn't just this lovely thing. It's it seemed like so much of my experience in this blackness was verifying everything in the Bible is God saying, here's, here's some information. Here's some stuff that's going to help you in your life experience. And I, I don't know, that was very huge, but this blackness went on. Uh, like I said, I, I know our time is limited. And I don't want to talk too much about one thing, but uh, ultimately, and I don't remember the transition. I was in a white room. And I thought it was very strange that I had no memory of being in that blackness floating and ending up in this white room standing. And in this white room, there was uh, this white mist falling all around me. And it's very beautiful. You know, the, the purest white paint actually has blue in it. And this room was the most perfect white I'd ever experienced. And I looked around. There were not light fixtures. The whiteness, the, the, the white 
element of the room was creating its own light and the light was creating the beauty and the luminescence. It was just, it was quite something. And there's no light source, you know? How do you have perfect white light with no light source? But there is. And this mist was falling around me. And I remember in front of me, I saw a door. And having all these NDEs, I knew exactly what that door was. That door was well, the point of no return, the point at which I would pass on to heaven and I'd be done. And I pretty much said to the angels, out of my way, I'm doing the door. You know, I'm, this is, <laughs> I got out of this thing clean. You know, I closed my eyes, had a little drug there at the end and I'm out. But an angel was accompanying me as I walked because I remember thinking that door was maybe 15 to 20 feet in front of me. And I remember thinking, I don't know if I have feet, but I know I can move with intention. So I thought I want to go through that door. So I pretty much said to the angels out of my way, I'm doing the door. I don't know if there's a question here, but <laughs> if there's a question, if I want to do this, I do in a big way. I mean, I was really excited. I can't tell you. It's, I don't know. It's like, it was just going home. That was so clear to me. It's just so clear. I was just going home. And there's another song I love. Uh, going home, going home. I'm just going home. I I love that song. And it's it's descriptive for a reason. You know, our hymns, that's the other thing I've realized since I've returned to this experience. Our hymns are full of inspiration. They're so full of clarity. Uh, I listen to hymns a lot these days. The older hymns, the better. But so I saw that door and I, I knew that I wanted to go through that door. So I moved as fast as I could toward that door. As I'm moving through this mist, I notice it's falling around me, but it's alive. It's swirling. It's moving actively around me. And I tried to focus on an individual droplet and uh, I couldn't. And the I know that sounds crazy. If you're in the middle of a fog or a vapor, you wouldn't try to focus on an individual droplet. But there was a angel with me and I said, why can't I see this? And she said, your eyes have not acclimated to this new experience yet, but what you're seeing is a particle of light. And she said, before you go to heaven, you have to be cleansed of the muck of the earth. And that some people, it was explained to me, some people die with sin or uh, a disease so heavily imprinted on their thought, they think it's part of who they are. And she said, and, and this strips away uh, the muck, the heaviness, the denseness of earth. As a friend said, leave your muddy boots at the door. I love that. I just love that. And I mean, I had prayed every day about, I felt so guilty about my husband's suicide. I mean, that's part of the problem of suicide. There's so much guilt. You know, in the Bible, it says uh, the serpent beguiled Eve. You know, guilt, again, is the root word of that. Guilt is evil. Guilt will take you down. Guilt, guilt had really wreaked havoc with me. I revisited every conversation I had with my husband and felt so much oppressed of guilt. So to be cleansed of all that, I, I had prayed a lot about, uh, you know, of all men, I am chief among sinners. But then I also thought about uh, we are a new creature in Christ. You know, that that's our freedom. That's our that's our being cleansed. So I don't know. I had. I had in those 29 months, I'd really tried to to be healed of the darkness that my husband's suicide had left me with. So in this white room, it was quite something to know that if we have a desire for a pure and clean heart, we get it. You know, we get it, even with our mistakes and missteps. So I moved toward that white that door in that white room. <laughs> I did want to go through it so badly and so quickly. <laughs> And I paused at the door and I said, is this the divine will for my life? I asked the angel that was accompanying me and she said, no, you know, what's really interesting is I never even got the whole sentence out. All I said was, is this, is this divine? And I've often wondered, why did I ask, is this the divine will? Why didn't I just do the door? Why didn't I just go through that door? <laughs> but when you're in that place, all you want to do is glorify God. You know, what is the catechism? To glorify to uh, see to glorify God and enjoy him forever and that's all you want to do you just want to glorify God I know that's why I asked and it wasn't some lofty expression on my part it's just when you're there surrounded by the angels you just you just want to join them in glorifying God so I did ask is this the divine will for my life and the answer was no but whatever you decide you go with all of God's grace and mercy and blessings and care and love and I thought whoa I'll take that I'll take that deal. As I went to move through the door, the door was closed, which annoyed me. <laughs> um, 
I was shown an image of that nurse who had promised me I wasn't going to die. An image is not strong enough. It's almost like a vision. And I saw her sitting in a little hospital supply room, sitting on a metal stool, her head in her hands, leaning forward and sobbing a lot. And she said, through tears, I promised that woman I wasn't going to let her die. And I lost her. And I felt her, I, I felt sad for her, but I thought, you know, she's a nurse. She looked to be about my age. She's lost people before. She'll get over this, you know. And then uh, I felt her pain. It was like the extreme grief she felt over losing a patient. I, I co-experienced it with her. And I recognized that grief as, grief as the same grief I had felt with my husband's suicide. It was very deep and painful. Mm. And I thought, oh, man. So I realized I had to go back. And I remember thinking, if I can spare somebody that much pain, I have to. And boy, I tell you, I, I had my ha right hand up. By the way, right hand up to push through that door. I thought, pretty cool. Right handed on earth, right handed in heaven. And I thought, wow, everything we are does go with us. And uh, boy, I tell you, the second that right hand went down to my side again, I was back on that gurney with lots of excitement. I should mention in that, I don't know where in this experience, somewhere in that white room, maybe before the door, it was made very clear to me that if I agreed to go back, I'd be healed. Because I didn't want to go back to that old life. I didn't want to go back to the nightmares and the suicidal ideations and the misery, being shunned by society. Society does not treat suicide survivors well, especially when we lose our minds. You know, nobody knows what to do with us. So I was promised if I agreed to go back, I'd be healed. And, you know, the word wasn't healed. The word was restored to wholeness. And when I came back, I was a different person. I was so dramatically different. But anyway, when I came back, Suddenly, they were not so dismissive in that little ER. They were pretty. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff going on. My friend said they called everybody into the room, even the receptionist, to work on me. And I had uh, had lots of stuff happening. And then very quickly, very, very, very quickly, I was transported by ambul ambulance to a trauma center, which is what should have happened first. You know, they made some pretty big boo-boos. And at the trauma center, uh, I mean, a hospital. I was, uh, I got the doctor that, you know, been on staff for a while. I didn't get the young one. I got the old one. <laughs> and then they, they were really nice to me. <laughs> okay. In fact, something one of the doctors said, it, it really touched me deeply. But I guess about, uh, they, they wouldn't let me have any solid food. They kept me on broth and jello and stuff like that. And they said, if you start to bleed again, we need you to be ready for emergency surgery. And what this one surgeon said to me, they had to do a procedure on me. And he said, uh, we've got an OR room on standby. We've got a surgical team ready. So if this thing we're getting ready to do goes south, you will be whisked away. And he said, it really touched me. <laughs> he see, bottom line was he said, we're not going to let you die. That's This is not going to happen again. And I thought, wow, they care. My story got around. You know, they really care. We killed this woman once. Let's not do this again. Mm -hmm. But I was very impressed by that. And the procedure went well, and there was no need for a surgery. And then uh, I knew from the second I came back that everything had changed. Oh, my gosh. Everything had changed so dramatically. And my friends, I was in the hospital for several days. Turns out when you bleed to death, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, I was gone more than 10 minutes. And uh there was an expectation. There were a lot of expectations of damage to internal organs. They told me uh, that nice doctor who took care of me in the hospital, he said, you had a heart attack. And I said, not me. I ride my bike. I walk. I'm very healthy. Eat all my green veggies. He said, no, 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 you, you had a heart attack. And he explained what happened was I lost so much blood. My heart stopped that your blood is your heart is just a pump. And when it runs out of blood, apparently first it quivers a bit and then it stops. And that I had lost so much blood, my heart had stopped, and that I had some heart damage from this event. And they wheeled me away. They waited about a day before they started doing tests. I think they were kind of waiting to see if I survived. But after about a day, they wheeled me off for some heart tests, echocardiogram and such. And as they're wheeling me down the hallway, I said, no need for any of this. Angel said I'd be fine, fine, fine. We don't need to do these tests. And they said, we're going to do the test. But at each point in turn, they would come back to me. And I was on total bed rest in the hospital, but they would come back to me. Martin, you're a very lucky woman. Apparently, your heart is in excellent shape. There's no damage to your heart. And for some time, it turns out when you go back to the oncologist, very experienced and very prominent in his field, and say, I won't be needing that chemotherapy and radiation. It turns out I was healed in heaven. <laughs> they don't take it well. <laughs> so I had to find another oncologist. 
And I had to find one in another part of the state. Actually, I had to drive about an hour away. And uh, another, they, they wanted to wait a bit. And it took about two months, but uh, another surgical biopsy was done. And boy, that oncologist was extremely nervous about this whole thing. But uh, she said, actually, she was very dear. She said, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I want you to know I've been praying for you, too. And what was really cool is they did PET scans, CAT scans. They did a bunch of tests in the interim between this, me being discharged from the hospital and, and the second oncologist experience. But at every test, they said, you know, I don't see any cancer. If you do have cancer, it's got to be minor. So at the second surgical biopsy, the oncologist literally went running out of the door to the waiting room where, again, my friend is waiting for me patiently to find the outcome of the surgery. And she threw her arms around his neck and said, she's right. There is not one cell of cancer left in her. And she said, in fact, her flesh is so pink and pretty and perfect. Had I not seen the original medical test, I wouldn't believe she ever had cancer. So that was a big deal. But as I as I say, from the depths of my soul, the bigger healing was the healing of my soul. When I had returned from the hospital after this, I think it was four days in the hospital, I still had to have at home care. But I remember I flopped down one day and I opened my Bible and it opened to Psalm 23. And it was like one line was highlighted and it was he restoreth my soul. And I remember just sobbing over that because I thought that's the healing. That's the real healing was to have your soul restored. And it was life changing. Sold off every single thing I own, every physical possession. And I moved a thousand miles due west, sold my car as well, bought a slightly used Prius. <laughs> and then I sold my home. My home sold in two hours. And then I moved, and this was three, three and a half years ago. I moved to the Midwest because I just wanted to be around beauty. I just wanted to experience God's beauty. And I'm living in uh, the Midwest where we have lots and lots of corn <laughs> and lots and lots of soybeans. And I love to just park alongside the fields and watch the corn sway in the summer breeze or watch the little plants growing up through the dirt. I just crave beauty with everything that's in me. Mm. Rosemary, so much about what you've shared with us is not just inspirational, it is transformative in the sense that uh, I believe with all of my heart that there are those who are viewing this and watching this who um, have been struggling in their soul for a variety of reasons. Um, and they've been healed through this process. Have you, have you considered that, that when you met God, the Holy Spirit, and he had said he was the original and that you were made in his image as Certainly the Bible speaks to that as well, that maybe there was an impartation that you were going to be bringing back with you and that that is something you have experienced. I ask you in your ministry to, uh, to others, have you experienced that impartation of others being healed by your That son? is, I, I am so grateful you use that word impartation. I love that word. I, and I hope you're right. I, because Oh my gosh, I do a lot of podcasts and I have learned not every podcast is a winner. <laughs> I ended up on a panelist uh, on a panel of national NDE people and I was there with tarot card readers and psychics and I was like this isn't right. Mm. This is not right. This is not where this story is supposed to be. And so I try to be more careful these days, but that's the number one question I get asked is are you a psychic now? And even after my husband's suicide, I made a conscious decision to not go to a psychic. And it's hard because you have a lot of questions. You want to know what happened. But I told myself from the beginning, whatever I need to know, God will tell me. And I would, oh, did I pray that so many times? And I got some answers. I had more than answers. I had peace. And after this experience, 
one of the things that happened was I felt so close to the angels right after I came back from this, so close. And I asked them a lot of questions. And one of them is, uh, well, I realized I didn't feel guilty anymore. I mean, I, it was like I had been living in hell. You know, Psalm says, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. I had made my bed in hell instead of housekeeping. I mean, I was quite comfortable living in hell. I felt like I deserved it. I, you know, my husband was dead. And after this, it was made so clear to me that the guilt was over, done with guilt. Because one of the things I felt so guilty about was he, he was an agnostic. And I felt it was my duty to bring him to Christ, to tell him about Jesus. And I talked a lot. I can talk a lot. <laughs> and I talked to him a lot about Jesus was a real person. Historians don't even dispute that. How can you say that Jesus wasn't real, that Jesus didn't walk the earth, that Jesus wasn't a savior? How can you say that? And I had failed. He, you know, I don't know about the last hours of his life. But I know he seemed to be a pretty enthusiastic agnostic, and I felt such guilt over that. And one of the things the angels told me, they said, the Bibles were pretty clear. You're to work out your own salvation. Nobody made you his spiritual guardian. You appointed yourself to that task. And your job was to be a shining light. Your job was to be a sheep, not a shepherd. And that gave me so much peace. But that thing about we're to work out our own salvation, I was busy trying to work out his and becoming more miserable with every passing day. And one of the questions I, I ask the angels is, you know, where is he? What's going on with him? Is he in hell? Is he in heaven? What's going on? And they said simply that he's with us. To be released from the guilt I'd felt over the fact that he had not found God, that he continued to be an agnostic, was immeasurable. And yet the last day, I guess the last 24 hours, I asked him if I could pray for him because I knew something was very wrong. I didn't know what. He had a big he had a big thing happening at work, and I thought it was stress from the work. And for the first time in 10 years of marriage, he said, yes, pray for me. I was like, well, that's new. Every time I ever said that before, he'd say it's not going to do any good. So there was a new answer in the last 24 hours. So I asked the angels, I said, where is he now? And they said, he's with us. I was like, oh, okay. And I said, what is he doing? What's going on? <laughs> How's he faring? How are things with him? Can I have a chat? <laughs> and I, I did ask, where is he now? Um, I said, how is he doing? And they said, none of your business. And I said, you know, for beings that keep company with the most high God, that seems rather hurt. And they hmm. said, you know, you were married till death do you part. And I thought, yeah, I guess I was. You know, I honored that. I followed it through to the end. And they said, he's not your spiritual responsibility. Stop thinking of it that way. And one of the things I had done is I would say over and over and over again, why did he do this? I thought he loved me. I loved him. Why did he do this? I thought he loved me. I loved him. And the angel said, stop saying that. And it, it took me out of the loop. I had just been in this endless loop because there are no answers. And the angel said, you did your job. You loved him. You did love him. What he did, again, that's between him and God. That's not on you. You made mistakes, but you did your best. And you prayed for him. I did pray for the man faithfully. I, in my life as a writer, I've learned anything good that happens comes from a systematic approach. So I made a habit of praying for him every morning and every evening. And they weren't complicated prayers. Sometimes I just grab him and hug him at the end of the day. And I think about how much God loved him. That was probably my favorite simplest prayer. Mm. It's just to think about how much this heavenly father adored him and loved him and cherished him. So this took me out of the loop of these questions, human questions that had no answers. And it was so liberating. Oh my gosh. It really was like the shackles came off. And then the other thing that happened was uh, I had people staying with me in the hospital. Cause when you're in a compromised state, you know, you don't want to get wheeled off for a kidney transplant or something, you know? So I did have people, <laughs> staying with me, friends that would sit by the hospital bed and keep me company. And every now and then they'd have to step out of the room to get a bite to eat or for some reason they'd have to leave my side. And when they left, these uh, angels would appear at the bedside. And their numbers were great. They surrounded the bed on three sides. And they would sing me songs. And the songs glorified God. And I would sob because the beauty was so overwhelming of this music. And their voices were so pure and perfect. And all their songs were about glorifying God. And the more they sang, the brighter they became. And the brighter they became, the more beautiful the sound became. And I told them, I said, I'm really good at houses. 
not so good with remembering melody and lyrics. I said, I'll never be able to remember this. And they said very clearly, they said, this is not for you to remember. This is for your healing. This is for your peace. Mm -hmm. And they said, this is a thank you for coming back. We know how hard it is to see that and to come back to this. And I know that I will have that memory for eternity, but it was quite profound. You know, I've told this story so many times and there's, that's one thing talking about those angels singing to me that still is very emotional. Mm. Cause I, what do you do when the angels sing to you? Mm. You know, there's, there's something about those like you and, and I've had, uh, my own experience that I've never thought about when you just made that comment that you said the angels were thankful that appreciative that you had returned because that was a sacrifice yeah, to return was. from, from home, heaven being home to, to this world that you were obedient to his, what, what God wanted which was for you to bring the light of Jesus to this world. And I find it ironic that you talked about the black space when you're originally in that place. And a lot of people do talk about the light. Certainly I've talked about the light as well, but I was in the darkness too. And people hmm. have asked me and, and it was comforting. It was absolute peace. And, um, and that's the part that, one of the parts, and there are many parts, obviously, that strike me very deeply. Uh, and it is Rosemary that that there is dark, there is peace in the darkness as long mm -hmm. as the Holy Spirit is with us. That the that's a very good be, point. Can be condemning. It can be mm -hmm. scary, frightening. However, if the Holy Spirit is there. The darkness is peaceful, isn't it? It's like a, a, you know, a midnight sleep almost. That's a very good point. You know, after my husband's suicide, I had been terrified of the dark and I slept with lights on. Mm. And after this experience, I, I got rid of all my night lights. And I actually lived with a friend who lived out in the woods because <laughs> I wanted to sleep in the pitch blackness because it reminded me of that experience. Mm. And I would actually pull up a chair to my bed. And I would ask the angels to sit with me at night so I could feel those feelings again of being in that blackness. I mean, it is hard to come back from that. It is hard to even remember it sometimes. I mean, it's hard to think about it too much. But yeah, as actually I was talking to a friend who's a, a pastor, a very dear friend. And I've, I've been having, um, I've been having some challenges in life, like we all do, you know, physical problems and different things. And I said, I've seen heaven. Why am I dealing with this? You know, what's this about? And he made the point. He said, I know you feel like you've been to heaven and you should be past all this earth stuff now. And he said, but this isn't about you. This is about God. This is about telling people about Jesus and what you experienced. He said, so, you know, this, this body stuff is, is very, uh, what's the word? Ephemeral, very earthly, very temporary. And I was comforted by that because I do get this thing going about, I should be better than this. I had, <laughs> I had to have a tooth extracted and after two root canals, you know? And I thought, wait, I know about the original. I've been in the presence of the Holy Spirit. I've been to heaven. Why did I lose a tooth? <laughs> but, you know, they talk about Paul and his thorn in the flesh and they, some of the, Bible commentators now say they think it might have been a condition with his eyes that was very visible to those around him. So Paul, while he's out pr proclaiming this great message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, has this obvious physical deformity. And I thought, wow, you know, as a friend said, and this was comforting, a friend said, you're in good company with spiritual pioneers because, you know, you got you got stuff going on. And like even the eyeglasses. I'm like, come on, because one of the things that happened when I returned from this, I had I'd had an accident, a shoulder problem. I had an accident and busted knee. I had some high frequency hearing loss. Oh, I had arthritis in my wrist and it was all gone. And I mean, that's three and a half years. It never came back. 
my knee was fixed. My shoulder was fixed. And I, I did talk to the angel. I said, what about the eyeglasses? You know, we fixed the hearing. We got the shoulder right. We got the knee right. What's up with the eyeglasses? <laughs> and I didn't get a clear answer, but I was directed to read that story of Paul. So, you know, as a friend said, we still get our mail here. And it is a little, I don't know, it's, we're here on earth. A friend said we still get our mail here, which cracks me up. So, you know, all this talk of, you know, I've seen heaven and it's great. And the angel sang to me. It's, I don't know. It's funny. And not everyone's on board with this. You know, I've had, as we were talking briefly, I get some emails that are pretty wretched. I have family members. I mean, Jesus, Jesus said, oh my gosh, I was just reading a, oh, where is it around Matthew 13, basically, where he says, listen, you're going to lose family and friends and people are going to persecute you. And it's all just going to be a mess at times. And he said, part of the gig. <laughs> but yes, <clears throat> I've had several family members tell me that they don't believe my story. Mm. And I told them, I said, I have 400 pages of medical records. So rather than just dismissing this as some contrivance, would you like to read my 400 pages of medical history? Would you like to go talk to the doctor? Would you like to talk to the oncologist who said there's nothing there? Would you like to talk to some people? Because I used to be a newspaper reporter. When you hear a fantastic story, a phenomenal story, even incredible story, you, you ask questions. You don't dismiss it out of hand. And so, yes, a, a man's foes will be those of his own household. I was just reading uh, the introduction to the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Have you heard of him? Oh, yes, absolutely. One of my heroes. Yes. One of my heroes. And, I mean, I, he died at age 39. He got out of Germany, and he went back because he thought he, he, it was wrong for him to seek safety in America when his fellow Germans were suffering so, and, and other people were suffering so. Yeah. So he went back and he was killed at age 39. But he said one of his last quotes, oh, I should write this down. One of his last quotes was, to, be, to really be a believer in Jesus Christ is to be ready to die for what you believe. Mm. And I think that's beautiful. And one of my concerns with some of the prosperity gospel that's so popular is if you're doing it right, you're going to have peace and harmony and wealth and health and beautiful spouses and everything will just be harmonious and flow and be great. That is not the life example Jesus gave us. Well, it's not what Jesus said. He said that in this right. life we would have those trials. Those are Jesus' words. Of course, he suffered those trials. So anything yes. that Jesus has gone through, we should not think that we are an exception to what he had to persevere through in this world. And to your point, I think, Rosemary, um, those of us who've had these experiences, sometimes it's the stranger who is most accepting. You know, there's also scriptural reference that a prophet is not accepted in his own country, you know, and sometimes a, a afterlife experiencer is not accepted in their own family. Uh, and there's different reasons, I'm sure, for that. However, something struck me, Rosemary, about something that you said about, you know, that we go through these maladies in our own physical body, and I've had them too. And, um, you know, why we've been in heaven, touched by heaven, shouldn't we? be living uh, abundantly in every aspect of our life, both physically and spiritually. However, um, I think back of the uh, analogy, you know, I don't know if you've ever drank through uh, pristine waters from spring waters. You know, we used mm -hmm. to uh, go up to um, Yosemite National Park and you'd dip your fingers into this mountain fresh water and just drink it. But taking that water and pouring it into a can you know, a container kind of sullies the the pristine mm -hmm. nature and taste of that. And I think that's part of kind of what happens in our own experience. And that is that even though our, our spirits had been freed to fully realize the, the glory of, of God's presence and the, uh, the rivers of life that are... Uh, that are streaming from Jesus himself into us, unencumbered by our physical nature. And then we're dumped back into this can, <laughs> so to speak, you know, <laughs> and we have to drink those waters and you know, they don't taste quite the same, you know, 
and they don't, you know, that the can gets, gets all bent out of shape. And I'll stop with that analogy right now because we're in that broken body and it is not expected. I think that God has, and you, you speak so eloquently about the fact that, uh, that God loves us more than, than maybe we thought, um, not just was possible. I'm trying to not sound cliche, but he, he, his love is consummate. And that's the only one who has consummate love because he is by definition love. And you talk about that. And his love for you was to heal you so that you can heal it. I really do feel that way, that there are people right now that are being healed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to pray in a little bit. Uh, for healing, because I think there is an impartation that comes from you. You know, some people carry an anointing um, by virtue of what the uniqueness of how God has um, has given them that uh, uh, that experience or that impartation, as as we talked about. That I believe that you have, uh, mm -hmm. and I know there are people now. And I'm I'm going to say to you, and I know I've said this before: do not click off. Because you, you are, you love this story, but the story only leads to the impartation of what that story conveys to you. Mm -hmm. And the fullness of that impartation actually is the Holy Spirit that Rosemary experienced fully, that encountered the Holy Spirit. And that is going to be imparted to you so that you will be healed. Rosemary, you're, you're, you're healed of the most important part right now, isn't it? I mean, you, you were in the darkness of that, uh, having to suffer through suicide and your marriage partner and was he a believer? Was he not a believer? And the consternation that you had to go through day and night and all of those things. I mean, you're healed of the most important things, aren't you now? I mean, the physical aside. I am. I had a lot of anger. Um, you know, after his death, I didn't know why this horrible thing would happen to me. And uh, to be able to let go of that and, you know, to be truthful, that anger still rears up its head at times. I feel pretty angry at times, but I think, no, this is not attached to me. You know, this isn't this was healed. Mm. I don't need to revisit this again. Uh, that was kind of a surprise to me. I, I guess I'm saying I. Every day of my life, I think about this experience and I try to be better. You know, my favorite story, I know we're running short on time, but there's a story about St. John that as he was very elderly, he was the last disciple that walked the earth with Jesus. And people would come to him and say, what was it like? What was it like to be with Jesus, to talk with Jesus, to walk the shores of Galilee with Jesus? What was it like? And according to this story, he would only say the same five words to every single person. Have you ever heard this story? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was little children love one another. I just love that. I think, and, and I guess when I came back from this, like when I do feel anger, I think we are supposed to love one another. You know, that guy who pulls out in front of you in traffic and stomps on the brakes. You know, my first response is, grr. <laughs> but then I think, no, I have to love everybody. I just, I have to. And I don't know, another one of my heroes is Corey Ten Boom. I actually named one of my daughters after her. And she learned that lesson too. I mean, I guess it's just something we all have to learn is we have to love everybody. There can't be one person we hate. Even the ones who are vitriolic toward us. Right? Yeah, the ones that send me most, emails. <laughs> <laughs> it's been said that that is the most diametrically opposed principle that Jesus introduced was loving your enemy because at that time, of course, it was an eye for an eye. Yes. And uh, that's the most difficult part. But that's the second commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. But the first commandment was to love God with all your heart. And the second commandment could not be achieved without the first commandment being achieved because it's God's power that is that love that would uh, be imparted back to that word to us through us to be able to love somebody I mean to love somebody that way that slaps us on the cheek um, is an anathema to the human condition to love them that way only 
can be done through the power of God. I don't know that we can do it. I can't do it, and certainly. And, um, you know, Rosemary, I have just this one final question to you, and that is all of the experiences, and I know you've shared on a number of occasions that you've had, if you were to speak to, to yourself before this happened, because there are people like yourself right now, if you were to speak to that to yourself before you had this experience, um, what would you say to yourself? You mean the self that was trying to exist after the suicide? Before, before, yeah, we had a, a little bit of a sound change there, but uh, before, if you were to, there you are know, people that obviously have not gone to heaven, uh, they've not had an experience uh, that, um, of standing before God or the Holy Spirit. Um, if you were to go back to Rosemary Thornton and just speak to her, what would be the advice that you would give to, I'm, I'm talking about kind of a prototype type person, somebody who is like you, mm -hmm. having not had this heaven experience, what would you say to that person right now? Because they're out there right now, people like you and what you what you were going through. Um, what would you say to them? Hmm. Wow. I would say that heaven is real. And anybody who believes it isn't is awfully confused. And I believe that the more we love, the more we can experience heaven in this place. And that we are so hardwired spiritually for healing that even the worst trauma, because uh, in my case, I lost family members. People didn't want to be around me after this level of trauma. And I lived with that Bible verse, when, I, when your father and mother forsake you, I will take you up. You know, sometimes it's when you're, when those who are in your family forsake you, God will take you up. And I guess, how I would speak to them is to say, God is not some distant paternal figure in some distant place, but God really is very present. And that Bible verse, if I make my head in bed in hell, thou art there. That's true. Mm. No matter how dark our thoughts are, no matter how lost we feel, God is with us, so present. And I talk about this in my book, but I knew that God loves us. I mean, we hear that from Sunday school up. What I didn't realize is God likes us. Hmm. And when we feel this sad, God, God is there with us. You know, I, I just was reading the Bible verse that God is slow to wrath. And I thought, but God does feel wrath. God, you know, we, we tend to sanitize God and make God this thing that, or this entity that just, never gets angry i don't know there's i guess i i would say there's so much confusion in modern theology but that god really likes us and that's so comforting that god cares about us god likes us god is so present you know i no longer keep a list of daily gratitude i now have my daily miracles list mm. when i ask god to teach me something or show me something or let me be in a place i need to be to help somebody and those prayers are answered and I guess that I don't mean this is kind of an essay question to us, an answer, essay answer to a simple question, but I guess the big one would be our prayers of petition are very powerful. You know, ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened. I think we might get carried away with meditation sometimes. And maybe it's just asking like we'd ask a trusted parent. I need help. Show me what to do. I think our prayers of petition are so powerful. Hmm. And I think that when we're really wounded, when we're face down in the dirt and can't find our way up, we just need to ask God, help me, show me what to do. Show hmm. me how to take one step out of this hell. Hmm. And, and I guess that's what I would say to somebody and to keep walking, you know, that, what that friend shared with me is help me heal so I can help others. I think that's huge too. And I, 
I'm kind of surprised that I ended up on so many podcasts and, and all that, but the people who helped me were the people who had been through trauma. And then rather than saying, whew, I survived, I'm through it, they turned around and helped me. Mm. So sometimes we just help people one by one. And I think mm. that's what we're all supposed to be. The little children love one another. You know, how do we love better than helping somebody? In my book, I talk about the young neighbor who came by my house every other night and brought me dinner for two nights. I just think that was so good, so kind, so loving. I wish, you know, I wish we all, I don't know. It's hard to go through trauma, but the helpers show up. Mm. And I guess I would just say, ask God for the helpers. Mm. And and you're, And it's also a challenge for us to be that helper. Yes. Trauma is messy. We scare people. When in my husband's visitation, his closed casket, but as you see the couples approaching the coffin, they squeeze each other a little tighter, you know, because they, they don't want this to happen to them. We become, people who survive trauma become a little scary to other people. And, and that, that's not right. But it takes a strong person to say, your trauma doesn't scare me. I'm going to be here for you. Yes. Yes. It's like, uh, you know, I uh, used to uh, be involved and still are to an extent where uh, worked with Johnny Erickson Todd and with uh, her ministry and there were many disabled people and um, Johnny had asked me to, uh, to feed her. Mm. You know, she's a quadriplegic. And uh, I realized the, the blessing of, of servanthood by at first feeling uncomfortable for picking up the spoon and this woman who had authored so many books, spoken to masses and then feeding her some soup. And yet I realized that that servanthood, that getting over that anxiety of, of um, not being sufficient or not knowing what to do to just simply being, being a servant, doing what the person needs and just stepping in stepping in and doing it. So I think that's a challenge to each of us here. And that is that we need, we need to be those, we need to be uh, the face of Jesus, if you will, to that person in that crisis, even though it's ugly, even though it's terrible. I know, uh, you know, people are suffering with mental illness, drug addiction, all kinds of things that are dope. You know, that homeless person that you see on the side, that it's, it smells. I mean, we've got to be, we have to be the hands of Jesus in this world. Rosemary, you're seen. <laughs> See, you've, you've affected me in that way. So I'm going to now ask you to pray for us. And I believe that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will be inspiring you with the words, not to put you on the spot, but I know <laughs> that, you, that it's just going to happen because it's going to be the Holy Spirit. And your words are the ones, the ones that we'll hear, but it will be the Holy Spirit that will be um, healing us and speaking to us. So would you pray for us, please? Sure. Our dear Heavenly Father, please bless everyone who's listening to this. May they learn that the Bible provides such clarity and may they learn how to cling to the Bible. And may they understand that your word is so powerful, so far above and beyond what we can think or understand at this point. May all the listeners fall in love again with the word of God. And understand that within it is the peace of God that passeth all understanding. And that it can be experienced in the here and now. Even in the midst of life's troubling circumstances. That they may know your peace and feel your peace. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Rosemary, thank you so much again. The name of your book is Remembering the Light. We will have the, uh, 
the link so you can order that book. I strongly encourage you to order that, read it. Uh, Rosemary is an excellent writer, a practiced writer. And as you can tell from her, how articulate she is in expressing um, all that she shared with us. So again, Rosemary, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. All right, and now for the great news. If you are in Christ Jesus, be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Take care. God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.